Greetings, brother. Very happy Sabbath to you. This 12th day of December 2015 on the pagan Roman calendar. It is, uh, how come our volume doesn't sound like it's enough here for some reason? Maybe we, maybe, uh, there we go. Okay, I was just my earphone thing. I, I, I run that to check the volume. It's the 12th day of December 2015 on the pagan Roman calendar. It's the last day of the ninth month Kislev on the Hebrew calendar, which means counting uh, toward the next holy day, or I should say the next feast day, because actually Passover, the next feast day, is not a holy day, uh, although it's the most sacred festival or feast day of the entire year of those festivals listed in Leviticus. All the rest of them listed in Leviticus are <clears throat> Our holy days, including the weekly Sabbath. But uh, as Mr. Armstrong explained it, you know, it's not a day that we have to take off work for Passover. Of course, we definitely want to be there for the Passover foot washing service. In fact, it's the only one of the feast days in for which God repeats it. If you can't make the Passover foot washing service during the first month when it's scheduled to be held, it's the only feast day that God has a repeat repeat the, the feast day uh, a month later, 30 days later. It's so important to God that we keep the Passover. And we do that as a memorial once a year on the time that God prescribes for it, the 14th day of the first month. But I wanted to just remind us that let me come in just a little bit closer here. Um, I'm up early to do this uh, live stream for those of you who ask me to be on on the Sabbath before the sun goes down for in the UK. So um, I'm up this morning a little earlier than I wanted to be up. And to get things ready for us, I, uh, you know, I, I, I was I, busy looking through things and praying about what to present this morning. I haven't shaved or showered yet, so I'm going to keep the camera shot kind of loose. <laughs> Not get too tight on my face, unshaved face here this morning. Now, if I were growing a beard and trimming it, that'd be different. But as many of you know, I wasn't on. This is a rare thing for me to miss doing a nightcast program Sunday through Thursday night. I missed the entire week last week, and in fact, Thursday night from the previous week, because uh, I just, we're cocking the gun to improve some things for that program, and the way things are going, we need to do that and be geared up, because brethren, I got a very important program by Mr. Armstrong today, and some of you may be asking, what what is that slide on the screen here? I'll explain that in just a moment. As I'm saying to you, Things are such, and this program by Mr. Armstrong we're going to play this morning relates to what may be about to happen in the United States more than it relates more than it ever did right now. And I hope those of you who heard Mr. Armstrong say it or have heard some of us repeat, be prepared to reduce your standard of living have been taking actions relative to that. I've done that. I've got things so that I could live off a dime practically, you know, and I've had to <laughs> lately with some of the expenses I've had to pay out <clears throat> just to things and, <clears throat> you know, that uh, for your living situation. But I got the living situation, as Mr. Armstrong instructed us, encouraged us to do under inspiration from God to get our situations down so that we could reduce our standard of living and go ahead and get it reduced so that when this financial uh, burn down happens in the United States that's that we've been warned will happen when it ha when it happens <clears throat> you won't suffer too greatly because you'll already have reduced your standard of living and as everybody else is forced to do that and then you know, they'll lose things in foreclosure and what have you right and left when things like that happen. Ho hopefully you got your situation down where you can just maintain as you've been maintaining until the time for those who are called to the Philadelphia era who are living as a Philadelphian 
who are doing what we know to do, who are watching and praying. You know, the criteria in Luke 21, 36, it's is in one little place about being accounted worthy to a, escape the great tribulation that's coming. That's mentioned in other places in the Bible, how we're flown. We don't flee. We are flown. We fly on two wings of an eagle that God provides. And whether that's symbolic and means a great big airplane, you know, modern-day jet aircraft, or whether it means a, a chariot of fire, you know, because it symbolically could even mean that. Uh, God provided a chariot of fire for Elijah for his springtime elect, uh, his spring harvest elect, I should put it. Uh, no problem for God to provide chariots of fire for us. If he wanted to do it that way, that'd be symbolically a, perhaps the same as two wings of a great eagle. Now, maybe you say, well, wait a minute. No, symbolically, it's more like a modern aircraft because they have usually two wings, a right wing, a left wing, and a little tail thing that helps stabilize it, but two big wings, and symbolically, it's like a great eagle. But God could also do that literally with a great eagle. You know, he prepared a great fish for Jonah, he could prepare a great eagle for each of us that swoops down with those big claws, as it often does, and picks up praise. You've seen eagles even pick up, you know, small cub lions and carry them off. <laughs> no problem for God to make an eagle big enough to carry off a man. But now that behooves some of you who are eating the wrong foods and too much food to Get your diet in order and get your and do some more fasting. I mean, you, I've never you've never seen an overweight person in a concentration camp. So all these excuses about oh I have this problem and that problem, you know, and uh, hereditarily and blah blah blah. You never see an overweight, a fat person in a concentration camp where people don't. They're, when they don't feed them. So, you know, and since Christ calls on us to do a lot of fasting, since he's not here on the earth now, he's on the throne and fighting for us and engineering our salvation if we will respond and resist Satan, who's also there, engineering against us, which works in our favor. As I've often explained how if you go into a gym and you want to build weights... And I'm comparing this to how God wants us to build character. If you go into a gymnasium and you want to build weights and they bring you into a weight room where they've got barbells but no weights, they say, well, we got a gym you'll love. It's easy here. We got the barbells for you. Just go push the our barbells. You know what? There are no weights on them. You, no fight here. You do that for months and you've gained not a whit of muscle. And so, Brendan, with God wanting us to build character, he allows Satan to have at us because Satan is like the weights for a barbell. We have to resist and press against the temptations he puts in front of us and the things he puts in our mind that he wants us to dwell on that we have to say, no. Now, Sometimes we greatly need God's help to do that. So we get on our knees and we pray and we find out, oh, I'm not saying no enough. Then when those mighty demons are after you, some come out or go away only by prayer and fasting. So it's a good idea to work fasting into your routine. And even if you trip up, you can remind God, look, Father, I'm seeking, overcoming, and I'm seeking your help to do it. And make him mindful of that. And he will help engineer the help you need. Because he is. God the Father has made Christ the author and finisher of our faith. Christ has a big role for us. He paid the price of our past sin with his blood. And I kind of emphasize past sins, even though we may commit some yet in the future or trip up as we go. Uh, that's what grace is for, time to repent. They know we're not going to overcome everything overnight, all in one fell swoop, you know. You know, I'm 
just been baptized and I'm never going to lust after a girl again. I'm never going to lie again. I'm never going to hate somebody or want to murder them. Murder them. I'm never going to want their things and covet after things that belong to other people or steal those things from other people. And I'm not going to dishonor my parents. I'm going to always show them honor. And I'm not going to take God's name in vain or break the Sabbath. All the things that we're supposed to do, we find down the road, especially as we get before Passover. Had a, we had an excellent sermon. If you missed it last Sabbath, the sermon that we played from uh, 1986, shortly after Mr. Armstrong gave that Carlton Smith gave in Santa Barbara, California, on how to prepare for the Passover. That doesn't mean how to set up your table and all that. That means how spiritually we should be conducting our lives during the whole year before Passover and as we approach Passover so that we are can be worthy to properly take Passover as we are instructed to be and do. But overcoming doesn't happen overnight, and God wants us to see He wants to see us building character. And God's arch enemy, our arch enemy too, is right there to help us build <laughs> to build that character. He's going to put things in front of us and in our minds that we're going to be like Mother Eve, saying, "Well, hey, boy, this is." Uh, this is greatly to be desired, this forbidden fruit. Man, it looks good to the eye. I bet if I bite into it, it even tastes real good. Oh, yummy, it does. I think I'll take another bite. You know, Satan's right there putting all that in front of us to desire sin. And that by resisting it, we're building character. And as God sees that, he knows, okay, he can count on you, and he can give you more of his spirit. And he, don't forget Acts five. It's either verse twenty nine or thirty two. You know, God helps me a lot to remember a lot of scriptures, but for some reason that one I always, I always, uh, one of them says we're to obey God rather than man. In fact, I think that's what twenty nine says. And then thirty two mentions how God gives His Holy Spirit to those who obey. And let me just make sure I'm giving that to you correct. Twenty nine says then Peter and the other and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Okay, I had that right. And then go down to verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them who obey him. God gives the Spirit to us as we obey him. So it's important that we're building character, re resisting Satan and his demons, and just any sin that we ourselves might want to uh, transgress, commit, do. As God sees us build that character, he can give us more of his Holy Spirit. And as he says in Acts 5, verse 32, God gives his Spirit to them who obey. You don't obey, you're cutting yourself off from God's Spirit. You're going to be more likely to sin, have bad attitude, and, you know, especially at this time of year, we played a couple of weeks ago, uh, Mr. Armstrong, on a subject of Christmas. And the world's off into that spirit of Christmas now, as crazy as all that is and as pagan as it is. If you missed that, that was two weeks ago we showed that program. So just go back in our archive a couple weeks. You can see, find that one. And we have to be careful, though, brethren, that, um, as John Bowles pretty well said, uh, God gives us the gift of the truth with the calling he gives us. And we have to be careful even with that, that we don't hate those in the world whom God has not yet called, uh, who will be called later in the fall harvest, and we're going to be there to help them. And our role will be as servants to those people. Now, you know, it puts us in a very, in an elevated role, but, you know, Jesus Christ as servant gave his life for the rest of us, for the whole world, while we were yet sinners. Christ died for all of us. And he's right there working away right now at the right hand of God, at the throne of God, interceding for us. And believe you me, I'm speaking <laughs> just personally and from those of you I I hear from too. Ay, 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 ay. Some of the things some of us are doing. Um, 
I am, I'm putting it myself. I'm putting myself in the same boat with everybody else. But, brethren, some of the things some of you call me and tell me you have done or are doing, uh, I say you better clean it up. You better clean it up. We don't have. There's still time to repent, but you better do it. Do it now, or you'll find yourself left behind with the remnant. You know, it's God's church, but there's a remnant that gets left behind. That remnant, though they may already be an attitude, the Laodicean attitude, body of part of the body of Christ. Now, you can still change that. You're not locked in the Laodicean situation now because that era if you believe and follow the inst- the doctrine the instruction that God gave us on that when that era will start it's the only era that's been announced in advance when it will start and it's marked you can prove this in the book of revelation it's marked by martyrdom that's an era of martyrdom and God told us through Mr. Armstrong that era begins Contrary to what many ministers out there are telling you, I'm surprised at some of you ministers out there who are saying the Laodicean era is here now when God taught us very cleanly and clearly through his apostle, Mr. Herbert Armstrong, that that era would not start until Philadelphia is taken away to a place of nourishment, protection, safety, final training. You know, and we're taught, especially the ministers, this the Titus 1, verses 7 through 9, especially applies to the ministry, that we are to hold fast and teach as we have been taught. Now, how were we taught? Did we get it out of the Bible ourselves? No. Not a one of us got that out of the Bible ourselves. God gave that through us through a servant. He beat down, first of all, and then raised up and put through years of trying and testing and teaching people and learning himself so that we could have all this truth spread out for us, given over to us, given over to us as if it were on a wonderful silver platter. And some people want to, you know, we want to hate the rest of the world because they don't understand it yet. They can't. Their minds have not been opened to it. Now, yes, it's given to them as a witness and a warning. They realize they'll realize the suffering they go through because they rejected it is because they because they rejected it. But they they for the most part, many of them won't know how to receive it because their eyes eyes were blinded to it until they're called later in the fall harvest. We're called to be servants and to, to, to give a warning and to live it and be prepared to be teachers and helpers of Jesus Christ as his wife, his collective bride and wife, with whom he will share his throne. And we'll, we'll be given authority over cities, uh, provinces, states, domains, however they, God's going to call things regionally in the world tomorrow. Well he, he, well, he does mention cities. You know, you'll be given so many cities, and et cetera. And, and that's according to our work. So we shouldn't just be sitting back saying, well, when the heck's Christ going to come? You know, I'm sorry about the euphemism. I should be careful with those. But, uh, you know, when is Christ going to come? Well, brethren, as I've said a few times here, I believe a big part of the delay has been for your benefit and mine so that we could see ourselves and begin to overcome and ask God for the help with the desire on our part that we're not going to cave in and sin, give in to it. We're going to ask God to strengthen us with character building. And we may have to keep on working on that right till he comes. But if he can see us working on it and he knows our attitude is not to sin. We know we need him and his spirit. If he knows then that he can transform you into spirit and put you into the state where you cannot sin and you won't even want to, you won't even have a body that can do some sins that people can do now, that, you know, brother and I am pretty good at keeping a secret. Now, so I'm not inviting you, I'm not encouraging you, though, to call me and tell me all your sins, but some have and some do. And 
yeah, I pray for you, and I'm hoping some of you that have called me and told me you just did this and just did that will not put yourself into a situation where you'll do that again. Because wait till you see today's broadcast, compare it to the current news. Brethren, I'm in one way, I'm sorry I've had to be off for the past week on, on the NICAS news, especially with the way news is gearing around right now. If we can get us back on Sunday night, you're going to hear some stuff. And, I mean, there's stuff happening that's about to roll together United Europe in the way. Three things primarily, and I want to get Mr. Armstrong on in just a couple minutes. Three things primarily Mr. Armstrong told us to watch for with the coming together of a United States of Europe in the way it needs to be to become the, to produce the beast, where ten regions or nations will vote in with the help of the, of the Vatican, which, which is going to be needed because men are they, just like the, you, you can see that image above me, you can see the feet on those columns on both sides of me. They're made of, they're represented, those feet of the great statue that, let me pull out all the way for a second, let's see, how do we do that, yeah. Uh, you can see the whole statue, that's the statue uh, from Daniel 2, the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar saw in a dream that God then interpreted for the king through Daniel. And let me bring it, let me come on back in close now and we'll just keep the feet in the picture. We get down, to, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar was, as God told him through Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar was that head of gold on that statue. And after, he was the first world ruling kingdom. And after him, the, the, uh, the I'll go back out for a second, the, the, Breast and arms of silver rec represented the second kingdom, world ruling kingdom to come. And then the belly and thighs of brass, the third world ruling kingdom. And then the two legs of iron, the fourth kingdom, strong as iron, dreadful with iron teeth even, and strong. And that represented the Roman Empire, which was divided into two divisions. And those are represented by those feet, the of iron, the legs of iron and the feet made of part, partly of iron com mixed with miry, miry meaning common, everyday clay. And as many of you know, clay and iron won't, they, they won't uh, stick together. You can kind of mix, mix the iron in there with the clay, but they don't stick together. It easily fractures and falls apart. Well, they, that, that, Symbolism is meant to say these nations that make up the ten toes, the five on one foot and five on the other, five from the east, five from the west, regions, nations are regions, they won't, they won't get along with one another even within their same region. The, those within the east don't get along. Those within the west don't get along, and especially the east and the west, they've been at friction for a long time. But, but some event that is shaping around now, starting to shape since the problems in Ukraine, and then the problems with ISIS or ISIL or the Islamic State terrorist militant organization. And various other things that all combine to cause Europe, the migration problem over there in Europe now, with uh, amazingly, Germany having taken in over a million or a million and a half migrants, they're saying they're now saying, uh, they, you know, we can't take any more. Definitely, and uh, the million and a half we have entered illegally. They're saying it's putting their Schengen thing at great risk, and they uh, Europe is recognizing and saying, um, if Schengen goes, the single currency can easily go, and it's had a struggle as it has been, and they don't want to see it go because they've got this goal and hope and desire of trading. Interestingly, the, they've, they've had a more difficult time since the United States put sanctions on Russia over the Ukraine situation, and Russia has now dumped the United States dollar, so has China and Japan. They're dumping the dollar. All of this happening when the la within the last couple of weeks, and and happening right now. So this program we're going to play next 
and I'm mentioning these things, and we're going to try to get Nightcast back on the air. I know there are other ways to watch the news, but on Nightcast, we focus on the news that relates to the Bible and prophecy, especially the seals that Christ told us to watch. And if we're watching those and praying about those things daily, he says in Luke 21, verse 36, the latter part of that, after saying, watch and pray always, pray always, meaning from the top you know, with all your heart, from the top of your head to the tips of your toes, with all your being, pray about these things. Be actively concerned about it. That's the problem with those with a Laodicean attitude. They know, no, no, no. They have a lot of knowledge. K-N-O-W, when I say they know, no, 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 a lot. They have a lot of knowledge, but they're not doing what God said, do with it. He said, watch these things and pray always. Don't just watch it and then go to bed and say, well, you know, like the administration of the United States kind of takes a look at things. A lot of the news reports this week have been saying. They, uh, they say, well, that's over there. You know, we got our, you know, that's, that's, that's over in Europe. That's over there for them to deal with. Although we have some little small involvement. Now, we're not really going in and saying, wham, wham, like the way the United States could, as France has kind of proved with the way they jumped in. And Russia, the way Russia jumped in in Syria showing that within a few weeks, they were able to do a whole lot more than the United States has done in, the entire, in an entire year. And that's because of administration policy that wants to get Assad out. Russia wants to keep him in. Uh, Turkey wants Assad out. Turkey has just received, a, is receiving invitation to be the 29th member into the EU now. And that's interesting. And they want this Shenzhen thing. They want, uh, Europe does. And yet individual countries, especially Poland now and France, with what happened in France, they're wanting to lock their borders, you know, and have border checks and not have this free movement. And the Shenzhen thing rest relies on, is built upon the idea of free movement within Europe from country to country. But now these countries are saying, hey, forget Europe. We're going back to our nationalist policies. We're going to close our borders and have border checks. And that works against Shenzhen, which is free border movement, Shenzhen. And if they shut down Shenzhen, the whole idea and value and purpose behind a single currency nulls out or goes void, you know, and so then the sacrifices that still need to be made to keep the euro going, especially with the United States having put sanctions on Russia where there would be, without those sanctions against Russia, there would be a lot more trade going on in Europe that would be financially beneficial to Europe and the EU. Uh, Brent, I hope hitting the top of the iceberg prepares you for Mr. Armstrong's talk on, on uh, financial things related to what's going on right now. And how, if God hadn't delayed it, what he's talking about in this broadcast is for right before all this thing's about to crack. And it's close. It is super close. God can still delay it a little more, and you know, so nobody can say exactly when it's going to happen. But when he stops delaying it, it's going to be, as, Mr. Armstrong, as God put it through Mr. Armstrong, it's going to be like a mousetrap snapping shut. Pow! It catches that mice by surprise. Boom! neck caught in a mousetrap. And that's the way God has described what's how it's like a thief in the night. If you knew when he was coming, you'd have been sitting there with your gun cocked and ready for him, you know? Uh, but and you don't want to be like this guy in this picture behind me, you know, um, <laughs> with his head stuck in the sand. That's the point with that picture behind me. All right, we're going to go now. I think I, 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 other than I started out mentioning we're at the last day of the ninth month, that means we've got before the next feast day, Passover, we've got all of the tenth month on the Hebrew calendar I'm talking about now, all of the eleventh month, that's two, all of the, what did I say, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth month, that's three, and this year, being a leap year, we've got all of the thirteenth month, you know, there's month added during the Hebrew leap years. You know, it's God's sacred calendar. It's described in the uh, in, in the Leviticus. And 
A 13th month is added during a leap year, and that's this year. So we've got one, two, three, four months before we hit the first month of the new year for next year on the holy calendar, on God's sacred calendar. we got four months to go, and then 14, 14 days into the first month until Passover. Actually, only 13 days into, into the first month because at sunset, when the 14th begins, you got to be prepared, ready to go. Right after sunset, we do the Passover foot washing service. But you got four months and two weeks before that comes, just to let you know. Plenty of time to be putting sin out of your lives ahead of time, examining yourselves, doing what we should do. And if we're still here then and God hasn't decided it's time to go, guys, um, you know, we'll, we'll, you keep the Passover in your homes um, or in some little local place wherever you might be inclined to do it. But you're, you, uh, you can do that in your home, and we do provide a live stream for that with Mr. Armstrong conducting the last Passover service he ever conducted with video. Showing you how to have everything set up. I have four and a half months to go on that. Let's get to Mr. Armstrong with this program on uh, what's about to happen, possibly in the United States, financially speaking. And, uh, brother, thanks for joining me today. Um, hope you. I'm going to go ahead and say to you, I hope you have a good rest of the Sabbath after you watch this, a good week ahead. Check to see if we're back on Sunday night. Um, with Nightcast, and uh, and I'll appreciate your prayers because boy, we got a lot to do with our gun cocking things we're doing. Just a lot to do. So we may stay off a few more days. Uh, and my apologies in one way, but I think you'll be when you see how when we do come back, we're going to be have things a little better. Uh, organized and a little bit better. So I, I think you'll find it an, an improvement w worth having. Had to wait just a little bit for. Uh, but, Mr. Armstrong, sir, I know you're ready to go because we're playing your recording from a broadcast, a telecast. And uh, without any further ado, let me get the uh, over here, make sure we have the volume control up. Yeah, we do. And Let's zoom in, Mr. Armstrong, and give the rest of the Sabbath a full attention to a very important message that relates to what is about to be happening now, finally. Sad in a way. Yeah, I'm with maybe some of you who would like to see that delayed a little bit more. But we better be prepared because... Uh, the signals in the news are that this kind of thing you're going to hear Mr. Armstrong talking about is coming a lot sooner than maybe some of us would like to see it come. But uh, let's give full focus and attention to, uh, to Mr. Armstrong now, an important, helpful message that we should know, uh, Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong. statement ought to be thundered in banner headlines filling the whole upper half of the front pages of newspapers and also thundered out in newscasts. But this crisis, the financial crisis, is more serious than the world understands. It not only concerns the United States and Latin America, it is a world economic crisis. I was in London recently at the time of the economic summit of the most powerful nations. And I had meetings there with some of the heads of government. And I can tell you that they were even holding back a lot of the seriousness of the economic situation at this present time. What is happening can suddenly force a unification in Europe, a United States of Europe, that will produce a new world power, a world power colossus, perhaps larger than either the Soviet Union or the United States, and formed for the very purpose of destroying the United States of America. And that very fact is foretold in your Bible in 
the prophecies of the Bible, believe it or not. The World Forum. The Worldwide Church of God presents Herbert W. Armstrong, internationally recognized ambassador for world peace, visiting prominent leaders around the globe, discussing the cause of world problems, and proclaiming the good news of the world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Herbert W. Armstrong. Now, why could that bring a crisis that might threaten even human civilization as we know it on this earth? And that is just the seriousness of the economic situation at this present time. Let me make this whole thing simple. Actually, it is very complex and complicated. We're living in a time when human beings have made everything in life as complex as they possibly can. As hard to understand, but we make it all simple. We're now at a crisis at the end of 6,000 years of human civilization. God Almighty formed man from the dust of the ground. The first man was named Adam. And you find that in the Bible, and I can prove that that biblical account can be absolutely substantiated and can account for all of the conditions that have happened on the earth, the present uh, situation in the world today, the economic crisis, everything. And there is no other explanation, believe me. As I said, the first human was made from the dust of the ground. He had to produce his own food from the ground, his own shelter, his own clothing, and all of his own needs. Now, as the population grew, specialization developed. After years and scores of years, then hundreds of years, and then even thousands of years. Finally, one man began to specialize, and others began to specialize, but one man, for example, began to make shoes. And he would trade shoes to another man who was specializing in agriculture for food. He would trade his shoes for food. And so they began to trade goods that each was producing. Now in time, money began to be used as a medium of exchange instead of just exchanging goods or services and money came to represent goods or services and so they exchanged money instead of just trading the goods themselves. Now civilization kept on developing and finally the banking system entered in because in order to transmit money from one place to another the banks became a medium of that exchange of transmitting money. People began borrowing then from the banks because the banks kept money. And a system of charging interest then developed. And people began to borrow from the banks and have the use of money to uh, build a new business, maybe a new industry, to buy a new farm, to buy equipment. Now, the banking structure has become very intricate and very complex. And the United States government began to regulate banks and the system. And, of course, it was government money that was being used for the exchange of goods and services. And finally, those in the United States began to exchange goods and money with people in other nations. And so banking became an international system. And it became quite complicated. And so one government is concerned with another government in its financial system and the financial structure. Now, as we come down to today, our largest banks have been loaning money and the United States government also loaning money to other nations. And so nations borrow money from other nations. And in this case, they have not nations, 
or developing nations, as they're called, have been borrowing from the developed nations. And, of course, among the developed nations, the United States is number one. Others are the nations of Europe and, of course, Japan. And so the United States, some of the banks, notably the uh, Continental, Continental Illinois Bank, a bank that I have even had a personal connection with in years gone by, had made some very large loans to South American nations, and uh, the government also had become involved in those loans. Now we've come to the place where the South American nations can't pay uh, can't even pay back the interest. And the 2% jump recently in the interest rates by the United States hit the Latin American nation so hard that it meant that it made their repayments, even the interest repayments, up to $13 billion a year. The South American nations think that's a greater burden than they can bear. But now, the United States has been giving a great deal of foreign aid to many other smaller nations all over the world. We've been most generous in that sort of thing, and we're always coming to the aid of other nations when there is some great disaster or, or something that is hurting millions of their people. And the United States people and the United States government has always been very liberal on things of that sort. But in South America, they think it's reversing the idea of the big nations giving aid to the smaller nations. Instead, they say it is there, the poor nations giving to the rich instead of the rich helping the poor. And so... Some of the South American nations now are threatening to default and not pay the debt back at all. And if they do, that threatens the very existence of many of our banks, and it will hit the government, and the government is going to have to go, the United States government will have to have financial aid from the European nations because the whole banking system is so interlocked and intertwined between nations. One nation is more or less interdependent on other nations. And the European nations are beginning to feel that the United States cannot be depended upon to uh, be the umbrella over them to protect them from communist aggression of the Soviet Union. And they're beginning to wonder if they are not going to have to organize and to become one United States of Europe, a nation of their own, a super colossus, a great world power politically, militarily, and to fight their own battles instead of relying on the United States as they have been doing ever since World War II to protect them from the Soviet Union. So all of this can plunge Europe into reunification. There's been a great movement to try to unite them Biblical prophecy says it will happen and that they will come against the United States when it happens. Now, that is uh, dynamite, I know, to say that. But it's in the Bible. It is prophesied. And Bible prophecies have been coming to pass. And this will come to pass. Now, how can a financial crisis threaten the entire world civilization. To make it very, very simple, I put it in this language. There are two ways that travel in opposite direction, two ways of life. One is the way of give, of cooperate, of help, of concern for the good of another. The other is just the opposite, the way of get, take from the other of get the best of everyone else, the way of competition and strife and violence, the way of destruction, the way of resentment of authority, the way of jealousy and envy toward other people instead of love and helping and sharing and cooperating. This world is on the basis of get. It is a self-centered and a selfish world, and that has been the way of life.
It's a way of life all the way through. Now, what do people really want to get? People are bent in their whole life, and most people is just on getting. It's on doing their own thing. It's on having what they can have. I've known many people whose the whole ambition is to succeed in life. You know, I've written a booklet on the seven laws of success. I have known men that are considered very successful in the United States, the heads of great corporations and heads of the great banks of New York and Chicago. Yes, they're considered successful, but have they been successful? They made money, but their lives weren't happy. They never had enough. They made money, but when they had it, they wanted more. It was never enough. It never satisfied. There was a man that I knew well. His name was A.R. Erskine. He was president of a great corporation. His corporation went into receivership. He lost all of his personal money that was invested in the company. And his life was not so successful after all. But through his brain. And I don't consider that being a success. There's something more than just making money. But making money has been the whole thing in this world. When we live the way of get, that means get money, because money is the medium of exchange used in everything people want to get. It all gets back to money, and money is involved in the whole banking structure. So when we come to a banking crisis, a financial crisis, you're getting down to the crisis of the way we live and the very root of people. That's why, my friends, that the love of money is the root of all evil, and that is a law. It is the root of all evil. The other way, of course, would be generosity and love and cooperation and helping. There isn't much of that in this world, not much of that in the world. All world troubles and all of our nuclear fears and the fear of blowing up the whole world of the war, it comes over possession of goods and things and the power of controlling areas of this earth and the, the uh, wealth that comes out of the earth. That is what is back of everything, and that's why this financial crisis is such a crisis, and it's a thing that people have not understood and they have not realized. Now, let me give you some of the biblical prophecies on this very thing. Many times I've gone through this in Matthew 24, and let me go to it once again in this light, and maybe you'll see it from a little different point of view this time. Matthew 24, and beginning with the third verse. Jesus himself was sitting up on the Mount of Olives, and four of the disciples came to him privately. They said to him, Tell us when shall these things be? Now he had just been explaining to them that the temple at Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. Now that was going to happen in their lifetime. And so they said, Tell us when shall these things be? And they added, What shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world. Now, at the end of this world, he was going to come to start another world, and he had taught them that. They understood that. They believed that. So now they thought that the coming of Christ back to earth and the beginning of the next world and the end of this world would happen at the same time as the destruction of the temple. Now, in actual fact, the temple was destroyed in their lifetime in 70 A.D. But the second coming of Christ is expected in our generation now. It hasn't even happened yet after 1900 years. And they, they didn't know that, but Jesus did. So they asked him the two questions, really, because they thought they would both happen at the same time. Jesus answered in verse 14, he said... Uh, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end, that's the end of this world, come. Now the gospel of the kingdom is the gospel that Jesus Christ proclaimed. That is the gospel he had been proclaiming to them. 
you'll find the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ is recorded in the book of Mark in the first chapter, the first verse, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, coming down to verse 14, and Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of what? The kingdom of God, and saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, and told them to repent and believe the gospel. Now the word gospel means good news. The gospel is the kingdom of God. That is the government of God, a new government to take place on the earth and replace the present government. And that means also the present economic system. That means the present way of living. That means that the whole world and the world to come when we will have peace will be a world of cooperation, a world of giving a world of sharing and cooperating instead of a world of getting and, co and uh, of competition and strife and warfare as we have at the present time. After the gospel of the kingdom is finally preached in our time, then he said, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this same time, no, nor ever shall be. A time of trouble, of world trouble, greater than had ever happened before or ever will again. Now he's talking about something that is just before us now. The gospel of the kingdom was not proclaimed to the world. In a few years after Jesus' ministry was finished and after he had ascended to heaven, there was a great controversy as to whether the gospel to be preached by the church, the gospel of Christ, which was the gospel of the kingdom of God, or a man's gospel about Christ, just about Christ, that he was the Messiah. And they began to preach that and to say that the kingdom of God was just something in our hearts. They did away with it by sort of spiritualizing it as a sort of an... Uh, ethereal, uh, superstitious nothing, and uh, did away with all of his message of the kingdom of God altogether. For 1900 years, the gospel of the kingdom of God was not proclaimed to this world. After 1900 years, God Almighty opened up the largest radio station in the world to me, and the gospel of the kingdom began going to the world exactly 100 or a century of time cycles from the time it was suppressed. Now this is actual fact and it's something that has actually happened. We have come down to this time. The gospel of the kingdom is now proclaimed to the world once again and we're getting close to the time of the end of this world. This has been a world that is it finally come to its final crisis. Everything does center into money when you get down to it. Our way of living is get. And get is all handled through money. And it involves the banking system. And now we have banks going broke. And the government having to bail out the Continental Illinois Bank, as they had to do and take over 80% of the stock recently. You know, when I was a boy in my mid-twenties, just a young boy in my mid-twenties, as a young advertising man in the city of Chicago, I used to go to the president of that bank, Arthur Reynolds. I had known him because he had been president of the Des Moines National. I was born and raised in Des Moines, Iowa. Now he was president of the Continental, at that time it was called the Continental and Commercial National Bank of Chicago. I went to him at least once in six months, counsel and advice, and he was one who helped steer my life and advised me and what to do next. It, it was the largest bank outside of New York and perhaps about the third largest bank in the United States at that time. It's a very large bank. Well, anyway, getting back to this prophecy, and except those days, this great tribulation be shortened, there should no flesh be saved alive, but for the elect's sake, that is those in the church, those days shall be shortened. They shall be shortened. We have come to that time.
Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now, tribulation will come. It would annihilate all human beings, and nothing but nuclear war could do that. Just it, the nuclear war, friends, is definitely going to come. And it would destroy all humanity unless God Almighty stepped in to stop it. And you're betting your life that there is a God who is going to stop it before it does destroy all human life on the face of this earth. Believe me. People don't realize the seriousness of the time we're living in right now. But now, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man, that's the sign of Jesus Christ in the heavens, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they, the people on the earth, shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He's coming to end this world that is built on the get philosophy, built on competition and strife and violence and warfare and of unsolvable problems and troubles harming so many human lives. And then will come the second coming of Christ and a happy and a peaceful world tomorrow. The gospel of the kingdom is the good news of that coming of Christ, the good news of the coming of that government and that way of life on this earth, and it is coming. But humanity is going to let things get a lot worse in the meantime until God intervenes and stops it and then comes down and sets up a different way of life and rules these nations himself. Now, I, I, want to ask, I want to mention, in closing, a book on this very thing and what is going to happen to the United States. And uh, the last chapter gets down to what is going to happen to us, but where is the United States mentioned in the Bible prophecies? They do mention the United States and Britain. And here is a booklet, The United States and Britain in Prophecy. More than three and one half million people have requested this book. Call it a booklet, it's a book of over 200 pages. It's profusely illustrated, and it tells you things about the Bible you never knew before and shows you where the, Bible, where the United States is mentioned in the Bible and gives you the prophecies of what is going to happen in the United States in the very next few years now, and you need to know it. That last chapter in this book is very significant and it tells you precisely what biblical prophecy says is going to happen to us in the comparatively near future. Now, I mentioned this book of the seven laws of success and I have a copy of it right here. And uh, All right, me... Brethren, I'm going to go ahead and come on out uh, of the program right there. Uh, that uh, booklet he's mentioning, United States and Britain in Prophecy, that last chapter to read, you know, that is important. And what I may uh, try to do for us, I'm going to go ahead and fade that off, is uh, I'm going to bring that back to that guy we had poking his head in the sand because uh, I'll come back and finish my comment in a moment. Because you heard in the program Mr. Armstrong commenting about, you know, about how a lot of people just go about their lives ignoring the things prophesied to happen, the things happening in the world that are going to have tremendous impact on the world. And people just acting like, well, you know, we had problems before, we just go on. It's come down to where it hits, you know, it's going to slam. Um, but that last chapter, Mr. Armstrong was talking about, and uh, I know I said goodbye earlier, but I'm going to come back and just say a few closing words uh, here. That last chapter, Mr. Armstrong was talking about in the United States and British Commonwealth and Prophecy, or United States and the U.K., as it is now, more just the United Kingdom than the British Commonwealth. Uh, <clears throat> it's so important that now it is available on our library. 
Uh, if you go to our homepage, cogtv.org, press the library menu at the top, and then uh, you'll see the United States and Britain Commonwealth. You can read it right there online. Just press the button for that booklet. Under the library menu, you'll see United States and and BC, US and BC in prophecy, or US and UK in prophecy, however we've got it labeled now. Same book, you know. <clears throat> and that last chapter, well worth reading. In fact, so much so that I'll be praying about that this week. Maybe, maybe we'll read some of the important parts of that chapter, if, if not maybe all of it, uh, next Sabbath. <clears throat> Just to really, really focus on where Mr. Armstrong is, is, uh, was directing us to go before his death and a big delay, uh, again, a big delay for your sake and mine, that we might be showing God some good overcoming. We need to do that. And uh, that includes, you know, that includes all of us, ministers, laymen, members, you know, scattered laymen everywhere. And uh, don't have your head in the sand because it'll sneak up on you. Wham! You need to be praying with all your heart. Now, I was mentioning earlier, and I didn't really, I sidetracked, didn't really finish that comment fully, about Luke 21, verse 36. I was saying how Christ gives, he, was, he spoke that while he was on the earth, you know, and he, he gives a summary of what you need to do in order to be accounted worthy to escape. And he just mentions two things. He says, watch. And what did he mean by watch? Now, we're in verse 36 of Luke 21. If you back up a couple of verses to verse 34 in Luke 21, he tells you something different than what he's telling you in verse 36. I've heard some ministers make arguments against this plain language by Jesus Christ trying to wash it away. And they one even saying, well, you see, this watching and praying didn't work. 20, 30 years ago while Mr. Armstrong is alive. So he essentially just says you can just forget that. Well, God's given us a delay for a reason, and he, he wants to see us not sticking our head in the sand, but watching and praying, being concerned about other people, not just ourselves. But in verse 36 where he says, watch, well, let's read that first, and then we'll back up a couple verses. He says... Uh, I got Luke 12. I meant to have that reversed Luke 2 1, not 1 2. Luke 21, verse 36. He says, Watch you therefore and pray always. We'll go back to 34 so you'll get the sense of the therefore in a moment. And pray always that. Now, he didn't, he, you can do this. You can say, God, please, I want to be accounted where you escape. You can pray that. But what he's, he's saying here is, Pray always. Pray from the bottom of your heart about the things you're watching. And then he's holding out a little promise to you. It's like a carrot where he says, uh, if you do this, the reward is to be accounted worthy to escape. So pray about these things I told you to watch. Now, what's he been describing in the rest of Luke 21 except the four seals that are active. And then when, he, then when he says, notice this verse carefully, when he says, do these two things, watch and pray always. Pray from, with all your heart, from the top of your head, tips of your toes, throughout the day. Be concerned about other people that are having these events related to the first four seals. I'll put the slide up in a moment real quickly on the screen. Watch these things and then don't just say, well, that's happening over there. No, get your heart into it. Pray for those people because it's going to be happening at home soon. And he says, if you do these two things, if you watch and pray, that you may be accounted worthy to escape. Escape what? Now, this keys you in on what we're supposed to be watching because he says, escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, what things are yet to happen that shall come to pass? He was describing the seals of, of Revelation. There's seven seals. Let me put them on the screen for a moment here. Let's see. I think if we go to this button, yeah, well, let's bring them forward and let's just zero in on the first few of these. If I can find, if I can get that button to work, let's try it again. 
Yep, there we go. Now, the first four, are, I was saying, are active now. They're represented by four co colored horses. Many of you know this. We're just going to review them very quickly here before we close today. The first seal is depicted in Revelation by a white horse that Jesus Christ described in plain language as religious deception. Christ saying that many shall come in my, in Matthew 24, he put it this way, many shall come in my name saying that I, Jesus, am in, indeed the Christ, and yet they'll deceive many. So there'll be false Christ, all kinds of religious deception. That's the first seal depicted by the white horse. The second seal depicted by a red horse, Jesus Christ described in plain language as war and rumors of war, and world war, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We've had two rounds of world war. We're waiting on, you know, I mean, we're not eagerly waiting on it. In one way, we're not. In another way, the sooner it comes, the sooner Christ can return. But we're waiting on round three of world war. And as that commences, Europe will have united. And that will dovetail into the fifth seal I'll get to in a moment. So just remember that. Europe will unite, and that will kick off the fifth seal. But uh, at the same time as this is happening, and these have been happening since Christ, way back there since Christ, but they're now happening with increased frequency and intensity. And that's what when Christ said when these things happen in that way with increased frequency and intensity, then it's like when you see he compared it with a little analogy of when you see the branches of a tree become tender and the little buds on them start to spring and blossom forth, then you know that summer is nigh. And Christ put it this way. He said, likewise, know that when you see these things increase with frequency, increased frequency and intensity, know that the kingdom of God is near. But before it comes, a few things have to happen. Let me finish the other two seals that relate to the colored horses. The third seal is depicted in Revelation by a black horse that Christ described in plain language as, as limus or scarcity of food or famine. And the fourth seal depicted in Revelation by a pale horse with a rider whose name is Death and alongside whom rides the symbol of death, Hades, hell, the grave. And Christ described the primary element of this as loimus, meaning disease epidemics, pestilence, the plagues of Egypt. He also said that between the third seal and the fifth seal, there would be increased seismus, seismic activity, commotions in the air, gale force winds of all kinds, tornadoes, typhoons, hurricanes, etc., and commotions on the ground, such as earthquakes, which is the only thing King James Version renders or mentions. But there's more to seismus than just earthquakes. There's the commotions in the air I just mentioned and the com other commotions on the ground. Other than earthquakes, there's also volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, wildfires, floodings, commotions on the ground, that kind of thing. And Christ also said only in Mark 13, verse 8, there would be terrace, trouble, but not your mega trouble of the fifth seal, the great tribulation, but trouble that leads up to that mega trouble. Uh, mobs, seditions, even roiling waters literally and figuratively. And then, now, and this is the stage where Christ was saying, watch. It refers to, he was speaking in time essence in a future perfect tense when these things would be happening as they began to happen shortly after his death. He was speaking of between the fourth and fifth seal as he said, watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. What is yet to come to pass as I asked earlier? Well, it's the next seal and then the seals after that. The next seal being the fifth seal, the great tribulation. That, as God has told us through Mr. Armstrong, that is the next major event in prophecy that's going to happen, the Great Tribulation. We covered that in a program. Oh, let's see. I put that on, uh, I put a five-minute condensed version. I'll try to play this for you next Sabbath. I played a five-minute condensed version. I condensed a half-hour program down to five minutes, just taking the, the key words, the highlighted emphasis words Mr. Armstrong spoke to 
where he was pointing out the next major event in prophecy is the Great Tribulation. I'll try to play that for you next Sabbath. And if you want to poke around for it, it's on my YouTube Sabbath service channel. But uh, I'll, I'll play it here live next week. I'll try to do that. In addition to covering the last chapter of the book on United States and Britain and prophecy. <clears throat> but uh, the next things to happen begin with the fifth seal, the Great Tribulation. That will be a period of, 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 of happenings that run two and a half years of Great Tribulation. It will be the time of mar the martyrdom of God's people. Let me, uh, let me back out of this for a moment. Let me come out. What we're going to do is let me go, uh, let me go wide in the studio, and let's go in on these slides over my shoulder over here, and let's uh, see which one I want to go into first. Let's go into this crown of the Holy Roman Empire pictured here with writing around it that explain what will happen during the Great Tribulation. This this throne is going to be worn when, once the Great Tribulation commences. In fact, the the power, the man, who the Bible calls the beast, along with the whole Roman Empire that he represents, is called the beast. The man who wears this, who heads that revived Holy Roman Empire, will, he'll kick off and commence World War III. He'll kick off and commence the Great Tribulation. It'll be a time of the greatest martyrdom of God's saints that has ever hit this earth. In fact, Christ, in referring to this time during in plain language, says that the Great Tribulation, as he mentions it in Matthew 24, around verse 21, 22, he says, it's the greatest time of trouble on the earth since the beginning of the world to the time this thing begins, no, nor ever after. Nothing after it's going to be as bad as what's coming, and nothing before it's ever been as bad either. You can read that yourself in Matthew 24, in verse 20, Let's start in verse 20. It says, But pray that your flight, and referring to the flight that's mentioned in Luke 21, 30, that you may be accounted worthy to escape. In Revelation, God says he'll fly us to a place in the wilderness. Daniel 11 mentions that place as being just east of the Jordan River, between from the Dead Sea, from Lake Tiberias on one end, as it's called now, Lake Tiberias, down to the Dead Sea. That riverway, that waterway there, just to the east of that, is an area where what God mentions in Daniel, an area God mentions in Daniel 11 around verses 40, 41, 42, where he says, uh, the, the, mentions the land of the children of Ammon and the land of Edom and Moab, Petra being a suburb kind of just a little south of Edom. God says that's the only, in Daniel 11, Verse 40, 41, 42, God says that's the only area on the entire face of the earth during the Great Tribulation that will be outside the reach of the beast. In other words, the beast, that will be protected from the beast. But uh, And those whom God protects, those he mentions in Luke 21, 36, at the last part, who are accounted worthy to escape, that's where we will be flown. The rest of the remnant of, of God's church that is left behind, they, be, they become the Philadelphia era because their attitude was just to learn, learn, learn and have knowledge, 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 but, but not to do, not to be doers of the word. They just learned it and didn't do it. They didn't pray always, as Christ said, to be doing. And that means not just a rote prayer, but pray from the bottom of your heart with real intensity and feeling. Now, it may look like this fellow in this, uh, on his knees up here is praying in one way. He's all bent over on his knees. <laughs> his hands aren't folded and his head's not bowed before God. He's just stuck it in the sand. He is not watching. He is not praying. That man will be surprised, or, you know, the man that, the people whom this man would represent will be shocked and surprised to find that he's left behind, as you see his behind sticking up in the air there. He will be left behind and become what God calls the, Phila the uh, Laodicean era. That begins once Philadelphia is taken to a place in the wilderness. But this beast that will wear this crown, things that will happen during the Great Tribulation that we've got listed on this slide here include... God's two witnesses, uh, 
testifying to the world. That's their time. They'll do that during that two and a half years plus another year. Now, we've mentioned Philadelphia has flown to the wilderness, a place of uh, nourishment, protection, safety, final training. Uh, but here we got uh, the two witnesses testifying for this entire two and a half year period of the Great Tribulation. But there's something else to occur. Let's, uh, let's come out and then uh, let's bring on the screen the full slide. Uh, I'll put this back up for a moment. Let's just put on the slide that uh, has the first five. And then from this slide, I can widen that, I think, yeah, to the uh, full chart of all seven seals. Now, you'll see after the two and a half year period of the fifth seal, that lar large orange column there on the left side of the screen, one, two, three, four, five, it says five on top, great tribulation. Then the sixth seal, very short seal, it just is a sign in the heavens, an astro sign in the sun, moon, and the stars, signaling that the fifth seal, uh, we're transitioning now from the fifth seal, even though the Great Tribulation kind of continues, but it's basically a two and a half year period. We're transitioning now over to the seventh seal, a one-year period of the day of the Lord. The two witnesses continue to testify, their whole testifying period of time is three and a half years. Two and a half during the Great Tribulation, one year during the Day of the Lord. You know, it's, Day of the Lord is prophetic. Uh, this is a period of a time and times and half a time. So you got those times and a half during the Great Tribulation. You got one more time to go. A day in prophecy is, a, is as a year. And the Day of the Lord is a one year long time of prophetic events that are known as the seventh seal, consisting of seven trumpets. The first four trumpets being the four winds, as you see pictured here on the right side of the chart, and the last three trumpets being the last three woes. First you got the two woes, and then you've got that third woe, which is the seventh trumpet, the fourth and fifth, the first and second woes, which are the fifth and sixth trumpets, and then the third woe is the seventh trumpet consists of the seven last plagues. And of course, when that seventh trumpet is sounded, Christ returns, his elect are, well, first of all, the dead in Christ rise, they're transformed, their life put back in their bodies, and they're transformed to spirit, and they rise first first to meet Christ in the air, and then those of us which are alive, who are alive and remain, then we go up after those who have died in Christ. That happens on that seventh trumpet, and we see the seven last plagues being poured out as spirit beings. We no longer need that place of nourishment, protection, safety, uh, because we won't be affected by these plagues that are poured out during that seventh trumpet. And between, now if you back up a little bit to see right after the astro signs, the sixth seal, between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, you'll see there's a column that says 144,000 are sealed. That happens right after the astro signs. And then there's a little before that one year long seventh seal commences, there's a period of a half hour of silence in the heavens that God has everybody just be quiet before he does this pouring out of God's wrath. The Great Tribulation is the wrath of Satan during the days of Satan and man. It's not God's wrath, as some have confused. God's wrath comes later during the seventh seal, during the day of the Lord. You know, the day of the Lord is not a day of the week. It's not Sunday. It's a year-long period of... of the outpouring of God's wrath. Um, and you definitely want to be in, on God's team. You want to be in that place of nourishment, protection, safety during that time, too. That whole three and a half years, two and a half great tribulation, one year of day of the Lord. Okay, I just wanted to summarize that for you because we're getting to a point where these things are about to happen and where uh, God be with you that you be accounted worthy to escape these things, brethren, because uh, you don't want to be here during all that. And you don't want to be like this guy with your behind up in the air, left behind, 
to be part of the Laodicean era if you can help it. And you can right now. There's time to repent of that attitude and get a hot, zealous attitude, mainly doing what Christ said with his own lips while on this, you know, fleshly lips while on this earth that he recorded and that uh, had Luke record in Luke 21, verse 36. Watch and pray always. Now, I said before I close, I said I was going to back up a couple of verses and just make an explanation for you that some are wrongly using when they say uh, verse 36 means just watch your conduct. No, verse 36 means watch these things, these things, these things he's talking about that shall come to pass. I mean, shall come to pass includes those first four seals that are began their activity since the day of Christ, and they're still active now and becoming more and more active as they increase with increased in frequency and intensity. And then they'll trigger off the fifth seal. That shall happen. But that's the th thing God is saying that you may be accounted, you want to be accounted worthy to escape. That fifth seal, the great tribulation, the time of trouble on this earth that Christ said in Matthew 24, verses 20, 21, 22, is a time of trouble so great that no trouble in the beginning of the world has been as bad as what's coming during that. In Jeremiah, I think it's chapter 30, God tells us that it's, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble because he refers to it as the same in the same way that Christ speaks of the great tribulation as being a time of trouble is so great no trouble since the beginning of the world has been as great as what's coming and nothing ever after it is ever going to be as bad and that's the same thing he says about the time of Jacob's trouble in uh, in Jeremiah 30, if you look in verse 7 of Jeremiah 30, he says, Alas, for that day, great, remember Christ referred to it as great tribulation, so here's a keying word, and there's more that tells you that this is the same period of time as we go forward, especially as, Alas, for that day is great, so none is like it. It's even the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time of trouble so great that none is like it. You can't have two times of trouble of which none is greater. They're the same time of trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble is the great tribulation. And Jacob, especially his sons of Judah and God's true saints, will be great. Well, all of Jacob, because the prophecies in Ezekiel are going to be fulfilled, especially that one in chapter 6, verse 6, where God says, "If Jacob, if you don't repent, all of your cities will be laid waste. You know, brethren, we'll see that happen to all of the cities of the tribes of Jacob. And the son who carried Jacob's name was Joseph. He got the double blessing, the birthright. God's especially speaking to Joseph who had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who today, Ephraim being the modern-day descendants of uh, the, the, uh, the modern-day descendants of the United Kingdom, being the, the people, the descendants of the tribe of Ephraim, and the people in the United States today are the modern-day descendants of Manasseh. So especially the United Kingdom and the United States, if we don't repent, we're going to see that prophecy God gave through Ezekiel. You know, Jonah was told to go over to Nineveh and give them a prophecy that they would be destroyed. But they got on their knees, they fasted, they repented, and God repented. God, too, repented. God repented of the evil he had announced and promised to do to them. It, it's conditional. He's saying, if you don't repent, this will happen to you. And that's what he's saying through Ezekiel also. He says, if you don't repent, Jacob, Joseph's sons, United Kingdom, Ephraim, United States, Manasseh, if you don't repent, all of your cities will be laid waste. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful, brethren, if the nations, the people of the United Kingdom and the United States repented and we didn't have to watch these cities be laid waste? But it won't happen. They're not going to repent. I mean, I'd, I'd yeah, I've, if, if some words I could say would help people, the whole nation repent, and then God not do this evil against 
the nation against Jacob's sons that he promised in Ezekiel 6, 6, if we don't repent, all of your cities will be laid waste. That couldn't happen before the invention of nuclear weaponry, of mass destruction put on the warhead of a missile uh, that can blow up entire cities. All of your cities will be laid waste. We'll see that happen. That'll be the beginning, and then then we'll and, and that'll be near the beginning of the Great Tribulation, after a beast has come into power. Boom! And probably one of the first things he'll do will be blow up the UK and the US. And uh, one third of our people will is prophesied will be wiped out by the sword, by war, you know, and that includes those nuclear weapons, by the sword. Another third, there'll be now two-thirds of our people, will be wiped out by the seals of the, uh, that, that's the second seal, by the third and fourth seal, by famine and pestilence. The final third of our people will be taken captive, and many of those people taken captive will die in the poor conditions of captivity. A few, a remnant of those people will be able to live on over into what God has called through Mr. Armstrong, the world tomorrow, the millennium, and be trained in God's way and have an opportunity to be born into God's kingdom. All right, brother, and I hope that summary is helpful to you and encouraging to you to get on fire. Don't just watch the news and go to bed and say, well, that's happening to them over there as you snore away. Get on, get, you know, sink it in. And then get on your knees and pray as Christ told us in Luke 21, 36 to do. With all your heart, pray always about these events you see related to the first four seals. Now, I never did read verses 34 and 35. I wanted to read you from Luke 21. And then I'll do that and then we'll close up. If you want to turn there with me, this will contrast uh, the, a different kind of watching that, you know, God's Word is balanced, and Christ balanced it, and He included everything we needed right here in this talk He gave, because in starting in verse 33, it just caught my eye, it's very well said. Verse 32 first, which parallels a verse in Matthew 24, Verily, truly, I say to you, this generation, the generation that when it sees these things come to pass, which couldn't have come to pass before August 1955, when mankind was able to blow up, annihilate all mankind, uh, this generation that could see the annihilation of all mankind shall not pass until all be fulfilled. It's going to happen during the lifetime of those born in the annihilation generation. That's us today, since born since or around the time of August 1955. And Christ says in verse 33 of Luke 21, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, my words shall not pass away. And verse 34, And take heed to yourselves. Take heed. In other words, watch your own conduct yourselves. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this world, so that that day come upon you unawares. We're told in verse 34, yes, watch our conduct. So Christ has balanced his statement to include you don't you don't get you don't get to escape the coming tribulation by just watching world events and praying for others. You got to watch your own conduct too, as he says here in verse 34. That's the balance, and th th and there's different things being said. Watch your conduct, as he says in verse 34. Take heed to your and he summarizes it in three things to watch, lest your hearts be overcome with surfeiting, with drunkenness, that can be spiritual sleepiness. Surfeiting can be uh, overdoing of anything that puts anything before God, including eating too much. Especially surfeiting relates, the word means overeating, as the margin in some Bibles will tell you. And so, and if you're over, if you're if you're overweight and fat, you're breaking this command to not be surfeiting. You probably should get as much as food that has as much nutrition in it as possible, like organic food does. Because when you get the nutrition you need, your body's not crying out, "Eat more, eat more, 
more nutrition. Well, you eat more because what you're eating doesn't have much nutrition in it. And to get any value nutritionally out of it, you got to eat 50 to 100 times as much of the food as you would have to eat if you just spent a little more money. Bargain, really. You'd pay maybe double what one cost you to get an organic item that has 50 to 100 times the nutritional value. That's a bargain if you divvy that up. You don't have to pay a hundred times the value of one as you do to get the same amount of nutrition as just paying double, say, to buy something organic and just eat one. That's nutritionally equal to eating a hundred of the other things. You have to buy a hundred of those, and eating a hundred of those, you get fat and overweight. You got to use a little wisdom, a little smartness here. God says gluttons don't make it into his kingdom. You uh, Google or use an electronic concordance on gluttony and see if a glutton, see if God doesn't mention an exclusion from his kingdom for those who are gluttons. And he's saying that here in essence too. Take heed to yourselves lest you become, unless your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, with drunkenness. That's literally drunkenness and also spiritually drunkenness as being asleep and not doing what Christ says do here. Pray with all your heart. And the cares of this life can cut you off too. Get rid of that junk you don't need. Keep Get your nose in this book, God's Word, so that that day doesn't come upon you unawares. All right, brethren, I, pro I covered what I promised I'd cover to you. I'm going to sign off. Hope you have a good rest of the Sabbath and a good week ahead. And <laughs> along with our friend who's sticking his head in the sand there, I want to thank you for joining me this Sabbath. But don't be like that guy there. Have a good week, brother. And I, I can't promise you that we'll be back on with Nightcast this coming week. We're still cocking the gun. Massive things we're doing. Uh, I'll come on if something major happens. But otherwise, we're going to focus on getting the gun cocked to get back for you know, we don't really start our year on the Roman calendar, but um, I'm going to focus on our coming back for a year before, during the time before Passover, the rest of this sacred year with a, a program that will help you with watching so that you can put your heart into praying about the things we can dig out from the day and show you in the evening on Nightcast. But uh, in the meantime, till we're back on there, I'll say uh, have a good rest of the Sabbath today, a good day ahead, and I'll look forward to seeing those of you who can and will join us again next Sabbath right here on COGTV. Brethren, thanks for joining me. So long. Happy Sabbath. <laughs>